Swinburne University of Technology. And um, so back to back to Weber's interpretation of the spread of capitalism. He argued that, that this practice that was inspired by by this form of Protestant religion um, actually helped establish capitalist practice because, of course, through the networks of of pro 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 help me here Protestantism. Thank you. Um, the spread through Europe of capitalism was facilitated in this process. Um, so this is this was part of, of this was a, sort of a, a a nice little example of, of Weber's Weber's explanation of how we can rise up and influence. Because of course, out of this practice, Weber argued. Um, we have worldwide capitalism, if you like, and again, going back to the very beginning, this is the context of sort of European sociology and a European approach, because of course they had various forms of mercantilism, which is a sort of a limited form of capitalism throughout Asia and the East, um, and even in the Mediterranean, the Italians were sort of mercantile capitalists um, much earlier. Um, and now, of course, we have, excuse me, the delightful irony of, of China being being a capitalist economy and run by a communist communist government. Um, so capitalism ultimately has spread throughout the world, and thanks to 1989 and the fall of, of communism, we've cons or the capitalists have consolidated their hold on the the economic organising system that that we we experience. So they're they're the three classic theorists in a nutshell and I, I, despite their sort of unfashionability um, of recent times I, I, I think it's important to understand understand the fundamentals and they're the they're the fundamentals upon which sociology was built but there there have um, and you'll see once you get to about page uh, what's up well okay well there, there are a couple of other earlier ones um, there's there's simul um, should correct that there um, there's simul who who like Mead um, argued that that um, society was formed by this this pattern form of social social um, interaction I think is how he terms it um, pattern web of interactions um, that, that Simmel argued constituted society. So, so you have this, this sort of interactionist view, um, which you would have come across in Cooley um, uh, earlier on when we're talking about identity. Um, so you have a group of theorists who argue that, that the, the theory, the way we understand society is, is on this, this interactionist approach that, that we build up our social world through interactions, through interpreting how people, other people work and, and determining ourselves in, in relation to these, these social interactions. Um, um, now, the contemporary theorists um, start with um, George Herbert Mead, which we talked about about earlier, he's the, the the man who talked about the looking glass self, the I and me looking out into society and sort of determining yourself and understanding society through this this interaction between yourself and and the social world, and then this was elaborated on by um, by another bloke called Irving Goffman who talked about the dramaturgical approach. Remember, I was talking about the front sta the front stage and the backstage, and so how. Um, our our social world is determined by our per perceptions about the roles we play in the context of this, the the social formation that we find ourselves in, and that's usually between sort of the public performance, what I'm doing now, and what happens when David turns off the camera and we laugh about how silly I've been, or talk about uh, what's just happened in the world and. If I could be any more relaxed, I probably would be even more relaxed. I might even go, that was good work, David. By the way, it has been good work by David, hasn't it? No, David's not sure. No, I'm saying David's done very good work. So, do you want to say hello? Just to meet everybody for the... Oh, David's going to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
This is David. David's been doing this for you for the last 12 weeks and has been a wonderful help to me. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll keep doing, doing this. So that was David, the fellow who's been directing me through the whole lot and letting me know when I've gone off track and um, when I've got a little bit boring. <laughs> But he's very kind, he's very gracious, and he's been very, very skilled. Um, now, um, there are a couple of other uh, uh, interesting theorists. Um, Arlie Hochschild is very interesting. Uh, she talks about, and she comes out of that Goffman School, talks about the, um, the commercialization of emotions and looks at, at, at the emotional life in society. and. Um, these these modern theorists um, tend to focus and theorize in particular areas in the the sort of context of the social world. So um, Horschild um, was trying to understand the, the the importance of emotions in everyday life, um, and argues that the that emotions obviously emotions are fundamental to who we are. Um, and this is always this has been the argument recently about artificial intelligence. Can you, you can we can we can produce robots and we can we can get responses and interactions between humans and and robots, humans sort of and 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 some sort of digital um, animal in inverted commas if you like. But the key difference is that there's you can't program for emotional responses you can program for random responses i suppose or a set of a series of responses that that um, that we would sort of attenuate to to different circumstances but you can't have a genuine emotional response in anything other than humans and so in that sense um, the emotional life of of humans in the social context in the social world um, is is fundamental and ubiquitous so of course it does need some sort of theoretical understanding because it populates all of our all of our interactions um, so the horse child is is particularly interesting um, and then she goes on to to argue that they are so fundamental that then we commercialize them, that we turn them into to products, if you like. And, and so um, uh, emotional work is, is, is the, the theory that, that she worked on for, for quite a long time, because she's been doing this work for, for a long time. Um, and of course, it's no surprise that, that it's, it tends to be women's work, um, um, this emotional labor, and is is sort of fundamental to um, um, to economic well-being of certain organisations as well. So all and even more so today, when we we have a in the West, we have a world that's that's becoming um, or Western economy that's becoming more relied on reliant on service industries than it is on on um, large-scale manufacturing and production. So the 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 air hostess or what do you call them today, stewards. Cabin crew, cabin crew, is that the term? Okay, so cabin crew today, um, and they are both male and female, um, um, and some of the stuff that, that uh, horse child was doing was, was when you had hostesses, coffee, tea, or me, you know. Oh, that's probably naughty, isn't it, these days? But that's what they used to say back in the 60s. It was terribly unenlightened time. Some of you weren't even, <laughs> probably weren't born then. Um, were you born then, David? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're having a bit of a chuckle about coffee, tea, and me because we were we were there. We, of course, went for the coffee or the tea. Yep, good. Um, but that whole notion, actually, um, uh, to to try and dignify it, um, that whole notion of coffee, tea, and me was the expression of emotional labour. Um, obviously, in in its most negative manifestation, but but. But the idea behind that was that these people were, and these women were there at your service to make you feel as comfortable as possible. So, to a certain extent, they uh, they offered themselves up their their emotional uh, their emotional selves to the greater good of the passenger and the profits of the company. So that's horse child is 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 great and and particularly interesting. Now Talcott Parsons to go from the sublime to the ridiculous and 
um, in some areas that Parsons is thought of as ridiculous because of his what would seem extreme conservativeness today, he was a structural functionalist. So he came out of the Durkheim school and pop into the 50s, right in the middle of Bewitched and I Dream of Genie and all those sort of things. And I make that reference because he's to remember the, the, the socialisation of children. Men are instrumental, women are expressive. Darren's out in the world doing the advertising. What's her name? Um, you all know. Samantha. Samantha, yeah, and everyone's screaming and going, it's Samantha. Samantha's at home twitching away, looking after Tabitha and taking care of, of the family. This is, this is the Parsons world where you have the, the, the male having an effect on, on the world, on an effect on the world, and, and the female having an affect on the world. So, um, and look, to a certain extent, you can see, you can still see the, the structural functionalist aspects of, of society where, and there's still probably an active debate. Well, there is an active debate, you know, the whole debate about housework and the apportion, apportionment of domestic work in working couples is still built around this, this Parsonian approach um, where there are still expectations that women, women are, are are more engaged in domestic work. You hear politicians, I hear politicians even talking today on the way here um, when they were referring to, um, to when, whenever children are referred to in terms of, of allocating resources, um, it's always referred to in, in the gendered context or the sex context of women and the gendered context about caring and going back to a horse child, the emotional, the emotional um, uh, work that, that is done in the world is always code for, still for women's work. So this, this structural functionalism of, of Parsons um, uh, where the family um, is, is a central component in, in terms of, of uh, creating our, our sort of values and, and norms um, of sort of social practice that we take out in the world and then sort of spread, if you like, um, is built on this this strict division between. I've just got a visitor <laughs> pressing his nose against the window because I got a little sign up saying we're recording. So of course people have got to go. What are you doing in there? Um, no, not a little error there. Um, um, Merton, a bloke called Robert Merton, then carried carried on this um, uh, this structural functionalism, um, particularly looking at deviance. Now, deviance we haven't touched on deviance in this course um, at all, but um, uh, deviance in in sociological practice and understanding is is uh, looking at, at at sort of marginal groups and marginal practices in society and and coming to understand why and how they exist um, and if if you think this this bloke Robert Merton is is talking about theorizing theorizing about society in terms of, of the the amount the extent and the nature of deviance in society looking back to Parsons functionalism to see how that could happen when of course the whole focus of the structural functionalism is to to inculcate um, conservative values, um, conservative in terms of maintaining a, um, uh, a standard, if you like, of, of um, normative expression, um, rather than necessarily being perfunctorily conservative as in the political sense. And then when you take that back to, um, to its sort of originating form in Durkheim. Durkheim argued about anime, that, and I've mentioned that, um, did I? Oh no, you won't remember that, that's, no, that's too much to ask. He's been good, but remembering anime is probably a bit much. Anime is the alienation from, from society that, that Durkheim argued occurs where you, you don't inculcate these values uh, and norms um, that most of society practice. So the classic example is homosexuality, um, um, the chance for um, anime, that is alienation from society, becoming lost and alone uh, and separate from the rest of the social world because of practices you engage in, um, your disposition and relationship to 
to the world. Um, and of course Durkheim uh, followed that line in, in one of the quite profound research projects that, that's still sort of in the top ten of uh, sociological research and that was uh, his suicide uh, research um, and he was looking at that in the context of anime those people who are an alia alienated from society by virtue of their practices so bringing forward to Merton, Merton will, Merton sort of um, looked at that um, um, to to understand better Durkheim's, Durkheim's um, uh, notion of, of alienation um, um, I suppose Dur Durkheim, um, what's his name, Merton dignified, um, um, dignified. Merton sort of, um, tidied up Parsons' st structural functionalism, brought it down to a less less sort of grand theory, and understood that that these deviant practices aren't necessarily uh, a disruption, but but can be can be brought into society in in a much more effective way than the slow evolution of change that that Durkheim and and Parsons saw. Um, then the, of course there's the big the big area of, of the the big area of sociology uh, or the two big areas of sociology of, of sort of modern times if you like and that's that's feminism and postmodernism. Um, and and there sort of was a meeting of of those two in a feminist form called post-structuralism that you don't need to know about in detail, but you can be aware that there there is this other other sort of theory that's that's awfully arcane and something you may not even come across. And certainly, at my level, you can choose to or not to engage with with that so don't don't worry too much about that but I just mention it so you you're aware of it anyway feminism um, uh, first movement um, the first sort of iteration of it the first wave um, was sort of Victorian early um, 20th century Edwardian period where women were were demanding some sort of representation um, uh, no taxation with representation was what they were asking for. Women didn't have the vote and didn't have the right to uh, represent a constituency in Parliament. They they weren't excuse me excuse me allowed to um, allowed to enter Parliament. So first wave feminism was struggling for the vote and then for the right to represent people um, in in the Parliaments throughout the the Western world and and. They ultimately succeeded with um, New Zealand being the first country in the world to grant the vote to women, South Australia being the first constituency to grant both the vote and the right to representation to, to women. So the Antipodes were, were running ahead of the, the rest of the European world anyway in, in this. So. Um, then the feminist feminism was was carried on um, after that so sort of that that initial win, if you like, um, um, in a in a sort of more the theosophical philosophical um, program through uh, women such as come on, David, you must know because. <laughs> I've gone blank again. This is one of those moments um, where I'm tempted to say, cut. No, 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 David's saying it's all right. No, David's giving me a funny... Don't say cut, that's it. No, no, no. No, 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 I can do whatever I want. Drugs, yeah, 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 young people don't take drugs. No, you were saying don't say that because this is what happens to you. No, I can say that. Yeah, no drugs because this is what happens to you. You forget things. Um, um, oh. God, I hate this. Just go and get a drink. Go. It's probably time for a cup of coffee anyway. So you go and nick a while, a cup of coffee while I try and think of this woman's name, who was married to John Paul Sartre. Come on, it's, it's, it's. That's. See, David should be doing this. 
<laughs> David should be doing this. Yes, it was, in fact, Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> ah, nice work, David. Oh, sorry. See why I've got him here? Um, yes, Simone de Beauvoir then, then carried on um, through the, 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 sort of the, the first half of the 20th century with, um, with arguing for um, uh, the right of women to, to inhabit um, the whole social world, not just the, the domestic sphere. And so her famous book, do you know that as well? Oh, he, he's having a think. He's read it. Years ago. Years ago. I know this one. I don't have to give the warning anymore. Um, what happens when you don't come first, but you don't come third? Second. Yeah, second. Second. Yes, second. Yes, the second sex. Yes, that oh, good. So Simone de Beauvoir wrote this uh, fundamental uh, piece of feminist literature, um, and I think I've. I must have talked about, I should have talked about it if I didn't, uh, The Second Sex, which proposes that um, a woman is not born but is in fact made. And her argument is that, that you're not born into the gender role of woman simply because that's your sex. The, the, the notion of what constitutes a woman in society is a social notion. It's produced, it's constructed, it's not biological. You don't come out as a woman knowing how to wash up. You learn how to wash up. You learn how to do the ironing or you learn how to be a lawyer or a politician. But it's nothing to do with your biology and it's everything to do with the social construction of, of gender. So, um, by the way, the other sort of fundamental or groundbreaking text uh, I'd, I'd suggest um, in, in terms of public awareness anyway, not necessarily in terms of the, the um, uh, specific sort of um, academic literature and, and understandings about what was good and what wasn't was um, Germaine's, Germaine Greer's uh, The Female Eunuch. Um, so apropos of that, then we had the second wave of feminism um, uh, beginning in the 60s and the 70s and really sort of consolidated in the 80s. And the second wave of feminism was then about really challenging the power of patriarchy and the power of the sort of male-dominated world um, as the, sort of the definers and the controllers of everything that happened in the social world. Uh, and there were three, three feminisms. Um, Radical feminism, liberal feminism, and social socialist Marxist stroke Marxist feminism um, all had a slightly different approach. Um, all were engaged in the project of improving circumstances for women, um, but they their their attitudes were were distinct and different. They were um, in a in a sense like factions within a political party. They, they, they can have diametrically opposed views but agree on sort of an overarching direction in which they want to go. The radical feminists were I suppose the most hardcore um, and they identified patriarchy as the problem that is ruled by men in the interests of men and saw f women's sexual biology as the site for, the, for control over women. So the sexual bio biology, um, the radical feminist saw as the way patriarchy corralled women into certain expectations, certain jobs, um, and and how that limited their their opportunities in the world. Um, so if, and if you think about childbirth and and those sort of attitudes I was talking about in terms of emotional labour based on sexual biology the the there were the the radical the radicalist of the radical feminists um, um, created a sort of a separatist world where where women separated themselves from men um, in in the 60s and 70s there were the, there was a movement of um, sort of political lesbianism where women were choosing to to have relationships, sexual relationships that excluded men um, for from a political context. So you've got these notions of of um, 
all penetration is rape. The idea that that patriarchy was was so dominant that that all acts of patriarchy were were an intrusion on women's rights. One of the arguments um, was the, that that all men oppress all women in all ways, um, which uh, seems hard to sustain, but you can understand um, um, how that how that per perception can grow. There was um, there was an incident with my daughter when she was, I think, in her last year of school. She's walking to school one day with a friend. Um, she gets to the crossroad just before the school oval. She's about to cross the road this car pulls up as they step off the curb and there's a man in it and he's masturbating in the car so you know she, well, okay idiot so she starts to go around the back of the car he backs up so they just stand there and wait till the guy does what he has to do because he's moving forward and back um, and so she wasn't particularly disturbed fortunately but what happens? She goes to school, um, reports it to the headmaster. Um, they obviously call the police, which is the, the right thing to do. Um, the guy, mind you, had pink hair and was in an FB Holden, which is a really old Holden. Um, and it, she said it didn't look like a wig. He had dyed pink hair. Um, not particularly smart if you're trying to avoid being being identified <laughs> later on so you know and you probably don't expect these sort of people to be smart B but the point is that what happened in in the school environment is there was a note sent well there was a message sent to all of the the classes in this quite large um, suburban Melbourne eastern suburbs um, state high school um, and all the all the girls were told that they either had to have their parents come and pick them up or they had to go home in groups of at least four or six. And that if uh, the, the girls that couldn't go home by themselves, they had to make other arrangements with the staff. A note went home with all of these girls to their parents. Um, now this sort of, you would say, responsible in inverted commas, response gives you an insight into the idea that all men oppress all women in all ways in that one act by a lone jerk if you like um, who may or may not have been harmful I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing that that this this fellow wasn't potentially harmful as it turned out it seemed not because there were no incidents um, reported that were linked to, to this fellow and this is a long time ago now this is seven or eight years ago nonetheless a whole school of girls was was subject to to a level of fear and uncertainty about their ability to walk the streets a surrounding community was also highlighted to the potential for fear and uh, a certain a circumspect that that women may have had in relation to walking the streets so that while I'm not while I'm not arguing that the the, the school's response response wasn't appropriate it's important to understand the context um, of th the effect of one action by a man affecting in this case probably thousands of women now the radical feminists would argue that this sort of action and activity by a male coming out of patriarchy um, was the sort of the, the sort of stuff that that didn't oppress just my daughter and her friend when they were walking walking to school but in fact oppresses a whole a whole whole bunch of women um, at one time so this is to rather than just perfunctorily dismiss the radical feminist view that that men are the problem and this problem is is wide and deep um, if you you think about it in that sort of context um, and you start to think that statement through you can see the 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 element of truth in in that statement so the radical feminists obviously had a reasonably narrow influence although one of the big and important things the radical feminists did was they set up refuges for for women um, 
who were subject to domestic violence and had nowhere to go. And up until that point, the, the sort of refuge movement for women was, was virtually non-existent um, in, in a sort of organised and structured way anyway. So the, the, the great thing that, that radical femi feminism did was to, to um, make this movement mainstream. So there was an opportunity for, 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 or there were many opportunities for women to escape um, domestic violence and and be protected, uh, be able to protect themselves and and their children from from these these sort of dreadful actions um, perpetrated by by men in in the domestic sphere. It obviously hasn't cured it because it's it's still it's still a problem and most assaults happen in the home. Most murders. Um, uh, happen in or associated with the home and family. Um, but radical feminism, the big sort of contribution, apart from quite a, quite a large literature, um, uh, the radical feminist made was to that movement. This has been a Swinburne production.